Let's move on to the next question. It relates to the science behind the benefits of fasting. There are some people, and I want to know whether they're right or not, who say that fasting actually has some harmful effects on a person, psychological, social, physical, etc. Is that correct? Several researches have been done by many scientists as far as fasting is concerned, and what effect does it have in various aspects of the human body. And scientists will tell us that when a person takes in food, it increases the metabolism of the body. When the food intake is reduced, or when a person fasts, the body metabolism rate goes down by about 22%. And if you fast continuously for several days or for a month, then this stabilizes at a lower rate. So the body metabolism rate is reduced by fasting. Further, there was a research done on various groups of male and female Muslims who had fasted. And it showed that there was a slight reduction in the body weight. But there was an increase in the glucose level. As far as all the other things are concerned, it remained constant whether it was the testosterone or the corticel, whether it was sodium, potassium, urea, whether it was cholesterol, whether it was HDL, high-density lipoprotein, whether it was LDL, low-density lipoprotein, whether it was TG, the triglyceride, all these, the body level, they remained the same. The fasting did not have any effect on them, except it increased the glucose level and there was a slight reduction in weight. When another research was conducted in Iran, where some men fasted for about 17 hours, for about 30 days in the month of Ramadan, it showed that it had no effect on the male reproductive hormone, on the testosterone. And it had no effect on the HPTA, as well as on the thyroid hormones. There were several researches conducted. There was also a research, there was a study made, which was called as increase in oxidation in the month of Ramadan on healthy women, a way for maintaining the weight, weight maintenance. And it showed that during fasting, there was no change as far as the physiology of the body was concerned, the weight was same and all the functions were the same. Fasting increases the fat oxidation and decreases the carbohydrate oxidation. And we have to realize that we have to let the physicians of the Western world, they should know that they should note the levels of bilirubin and glucose while fasting. The further studies conducted that fasting increases the mucosa developed B lymphocyte cell responsiveness, but did not show a change in the B lymphocyte responsiveness of the rheumatoid arthritis and the health volunteers. But in fasting, it increases the longevity of the life, increases the lifespan. There were many researches conducted in animals. It increases the lifespan. Further research was conducted on the lactating women. When they fasted, the fasting did not increase or decrease. There was no change in the milk volume, as well as the content of the milk. The glucose level was the same. The fat concentration was the same. The lactose content was the same. There was no change per se as far as the lactating mothers were concerned. There were research done regarding fasting's effect on menstruating women as well as the reproductive cycle. And when the research was done, there was no change whatsoever. There wasn't any change in the menstrual cycle in fasting or there was no negative effect, no positive effect. So it is wrong to say that fasting has an ill effect. There are many benefits which we discussed earlier. But there are certain positive points that fasting has helped in certain diseases. For example, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, it helps. And what we realized that when researches were done, that on animals, when they are sick, they don't prefer having any food. Same thing with the children. When children get sick, they don't prefer having food. It is the family members who force them to have food. 
And research has shown that when food is taken when a person is sick, it prevents him from getting well early. It hampers the immune system. So when a person fasts, when he's seriously ill, it helps him to recover faster. That's the reason now we find that there are many treatments which include fasting for various diseases which are followed by the Western world. Because when a person fasts, his body gets rest and the toxins are removed from the body. So it helps him to recover faster. And fasting is also good to change the behavioral pattern. And if a person is addicted or a person is alcoholic, as I mentioned earlier, or is a chain smoker, if he fasts, it's a good point that he can stop it throughout his life. And people who are habituated to things like tea, coffee, junk food, when they fast and they stay away from it, when the taste buds they don't have for the full month, the taste buds don't crave for that. And when they have healthy food, they start liking it. So it's a good time to stay away from junk food. If you can do it for one month, you can do it throughout your life. Yes. And there are certain diseases. For example, insulin-dependent diabetes. A person who is suffering from insulin-dependent diabetes, he should not fast because he has ketosis. Normally, the ketones are used as a source of energy. But if a person has insulin-dependent diabetes, he's unable to use this. So therefore, a person who has insulin-dependent diabetes, he should not fast. But naturally, if he takes insulin and fasts, and with the medical advice, it's fine. But the other type of diabetes, which is more common, non-insulin-dependent diabetes, fasting is helpful for that. And as I mentioned earlier, it's helpful in various diseases like cardiovascular disease, asthma, arthritis, digestive tract diseases, in lupus, in skin disease. You can name a list of diseases in which fasting is of great benefit. I think it would be really interesting to know, I mean, this research, has it been done by Muslims or non-Muslims? These researches have been done by both Muslims and non-Muslims. And there are hundreds of non-Muslim scientists who have done research on fasting. So it's not only the Muslims. More of the non-Muslims do research on fasting. But there are even Muslims. For example, if you read the book, Fasting, A Way of Life, by Alan Cott, he writes that fasting is altogether, it gives rest to the digestive tract as well as the central nervous system for the whole body. And he's a non-Muslim. There was a research done by an Indian doctor by the name of Dr. Shanti Rangwani. And she says that when a person fasts, there's no intake of food. So the toxins are created by the food that you eat. So no new toxin is created. And whatever toxin is there present in the body from before, it gets excreted from the body. So fasting is a very good method of excreting all the toxins from the body and it purifies the body system. It was done by non-Muslim. The research is done even by Muslim. The research done by Dr. Suleiman in the University Hospital in Amman, in Jordan. And he did a research on a group of men and women. There were 42 men and 26 women. And the research was done that they fasted and the changes in the body was noted. And they found out that there was a slight reduction in weight. And there was an increase in the glucose level. But as far as the other components are concerned, testosterone, cortisol, sodium, potassium, urea, all of them remained the same. There was no change as per in the body count, except the glucose level increase and the reduction in the weight of the human being. There were several researches done by non-Muslims. There was a group of non-Muslim scientists who did research in Africa in areas where there were famine. And they realized that people, when they did research, that people who were starving because of famine, and they lived in the same refugee camp, some people who had food and some people who were starving. But those who were starving, they had less chances of having tuberculosis as well as malaria. So fasting, increase the defense mechanism against tuberculosis and malaria. So it's Allah's mercy, alhamdulillah, 
can you believe? Because they were starving, it prevented them from having tuberculosis as well as malaria. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> the researches done by non-Muslims show that fasting increases the longevity, increases the lifespan, and it has a reversal on the aging process. There was a research done by a Muslim scientist by the name of Dr. Osama Kandil in the Harvard University. Muslim, but in a non-Muslim country, non-Muslim university. And he did a research on patients suffering from cancer. And he tried to find out what way do the cells function, especially the killer cells, which attack the cancer cells. And he did a counting just before they started fasting. And then he again did a counting on the 24th day of Ramadan, the 28th day of Ramadan. And he found that there was a marked difference after 21 days and 28 days the number of cells, the killer cells, they increased. And these cells, they attacked the cancer cells. And it shows that even the immunity increased. The defense mechanism of the human being, because of fasting, it increased. And there was another research again done in the same patients. And it found out that the T cells, which are normally required for the defense immunity of the human being, they increased to a gate level. And T cells are mainly responsible when anyone has a disease, they are mainly the soldiers or they are called the uh, major general of the army that you have. They are the T cells. And they go and they see to it, any disease is there, it goes and try and destroy the disease. And it is the disease which mainly attacks these T cells. Therefore, it's known as acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So when you fast, these cells increase and the immunity of the human beings increase. I would like to mention one more research done by a European non-Muslim by the name of Dr. Jeffrey. And what he says that fasting is not only done by human beings. Fasting is even done by the animals and the plants. And he gives the example, the animals that live in cold countries during heavy snowfalls, they stay separately and they don't eat, and they go in hibernation. And there are examples of animals like frog, which go in hibernation. And here they don't eat, they fast. And he gives the example in his book that even the trees in winter, when they don't get water, they're fasting. But the moment later when spring comes, you find that the tree is filled up with colorful leaves, with flowers, with fruits, and he suggested that every human being, every year, should at least fast for 40 days. And we know that it's first for every Muslim to fast in the month of Ramadan, that's approximately 30 days. And further, if you keep the six days of fasting in Shawwal, that makes it 36 days. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Prophet has already given us this guidance which the non-Muslim European has given us recently. So the many researches done by non-Muslims on fasting and it's very beneficial for the human body. Dr. Zakir, most of the research that you've mentioned, I suspect a lot of the other research we haven't had time to mention today, um, was done relatively recently. Um, was this knowledge, this scientific knowledge, available for the Muslims in history? As far as the earlier Muslims are concerned, some of the facts were known, some were not known. Not in the same way as we have come to know by the search today. And I'll give you the reason why later. Now the main question is concerned that, were they aware about these aspects of fasting? In a different way, may not be in the same way as we know today. That reminds me, I read a book by Maulana Abul Hassan Nadwi, Arkanul Arba, where Maulana Abul Hassan Nadwi, he writes in his book, Arkanul Arba, and he gives an incidence at the time of Khalifa Harun Rashid. And there he gives a dialogue between the Christian physician of Khalifa Harun Rashid and a Muslim by the name of Ali bin Hussein bin Waqid. And this Christian physician of Khalifa Harun Rashid, he says that the Quran is considered to be a book of sciences 
And we know the two types of sciences, science of the body, science of the soul. So what does your Quran speak about medical science? So Ali bin Hussein bin Waqid, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in half a verse of the Quran, he combines both these sciences. When he says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 31, eat and drink, but do not waste in excess. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes not the people who waste. Then the Christian scientist says, but what did your Prophet Muhammad sallam, say about medicine? So he said that he's mentioned that the stomach is the main house of diseases. And prevention is the best thing for ailment. And prevention is better than cure. And as I mentioned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number four, hadith number 3349. The Prophet said, the son of Adam does not fill a vessel more worse, more evil than the stomach. A few morsels are sufficient to keep him on his feet. If he has to eat more, one third of the stomach can be a food, one third drink, and one third should be for his breath. So then that Christian physician said, that means when you had the guidance of your Allah and Prophet Muhammad, we did not require jaliness. Jaliness, he was a very famous non-Muslim physician of that time. So what the Prophet and Allah say is a telegraphic message, which we have done research today. But the Prophet also already has given in a nutshell the message before. And in that same book, Arkan al-Arba, Marana Abul Hassan Nadwi, he mentions and he gives the example of another non-Muslim scientist who's an American. He says that every human being, whether poor or rich, he should fast for some days every year. It will keep him healthy. And then he says that Islam is the best religion, which has made it compulsory on his followers to fast. And he said that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the best physician who has prescribed fasting. And he said that there's no better healthy way than fasting. And after that tarawi, in which you have to do some exercise, according to him, which helps in digestion. So if you realize that the non-Muslim appreciated the religion of Islam after doing research, Though many of the Muslims are aware about the medical benefits of fasting, but we Muslims, we don't fast for these medical benefits. We fast for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't fast for the medical benefits. These medical benefits are ancillary. Yeah. Or they may be the maybe sweet dishes, maybe the desert. Our main biryani, our main meal course is for pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we discussed in the objective of fasting. We don't fast for medical benefits. Even if these medical benefits were not there, we Muslim would have fasted for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as whatever we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah gives us back in return. So all the acts that we do, it actually benefits us in various ways in this world as well as in the Akhra. But we Muslims don't fast for these medical benefits. These are just bonuses that we get, irrespective of whether we get or not, yet we'd fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, that's good. So when you Listen to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at his life and implement those things. Immediately you get some benefit in this world. Subhanallah.